It is because of you that we are alive and we are well and we are singing of your mercy this morning. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue in worship this morning, I love the message of this next song as just our posture to cry out to Lord.
worship you. You are here, walking in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.
good morning. It's good to see you this morning. What we do know is we miss you. Uh, it's just not the same being together like we always are. But what we do understand is this is the way the gospel gets out. And we want to continue to find ways to just share the word of God and get the gospel of Jesus Christ to this whole world. In fact, last week we had over 1,400 devices online watching and paying attention to God's word. That is amazing. And the number of people that touches the reach of Jesus Christ continues to move through this world, in this nation, in this region. One of the things that I want to share with you is just a word that God had given me. He's given this over and over this last week. It's out of 1 Peter. And it says this. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And then it goes down a little further in 1 Peter chapter 5 to verse 10. It says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the things we want to continue to do during this time is, is be generous because God has been so generous to us. And generosity is something that can spread. It can cover our neighborhoods, our communities, our region. I know this last week, just spending time with some people at a social distance, but being able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just be generous with your resources. Be generous with your prayers. Be generous with people, communicating to them, especially those who, who might be shut in, those that are struggling, just be able to look around and see what God wants to do through you in their lives. What we're going to do right now is we're just going to take a moment and we want to give this opportunity to give. Giving is so important right now, so important to help us stay connected, to bring the word of Jesus Christ into your homes and to other homes around this region, and again, around the world. Our website is canbefoursquare.com. You can give there. Our Facebook page, facebook.com at canbefoursquare. People have been dropping off their checks. Even last week, people were pulling up through the driveway and giving their tithe and offering as well. We want to continue to make sure that we're being generous people during this time because we're still moving. We're still sharing the gospel. There are just different ways God is giving us, giving us a creativity to touch the world and the community that we're part of. You can also mail it to the church. Our address is 2350 Southeast Territorial, and that's Canby, uh, 97013. What we're going to do is just take a few moments and just think about God's generosity to our own lives and how we are grateful and can continue to be grateful for the blessings that he's given us. So in your homes, wherever you are right now, just take time and think about God's generosity in your life in ways that you can be generous to others. Let's do that for a moment. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make a
Father, we just ask in Jesus' name that you would continue to give us that comfort and peace that we so need, that you give it to the, that to us through the power of your presence. So we ask today that you would continue to bless us and keep us, Lord. Just touch our homes. Fill our homes right now, the places we are, with your great presence. We're so thankful for all that you're doing for us. Let the gospel shine in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a little bit of family business before we finish here and uh, with announcements, and then we're going to invite Mark up just to share the word. We just want you to know that there are a lot of things that are going on. This is how I want to encourage you. I know things are changing quickly, and what we used to do, we're not doing anymore. What we want to do is encourage you to do this. Fill those in vacancies, those empty places where you used to be busy, fill those with things that are productive for God's kingdom. So what can happen is that you can just continue to look up, reach out, and see the people around you. I want to also encourage our prime timers. You guys are amazing. We want you to continue to pray for people where you are. Reach out online. Continue to pray and touch people's lives. I love to see our prime timers networking. They're spending time with each other online. It's pretty amazing. But here are a few things I want you to keep in mind. That's number one. Listen, if you have any needs, we want you to let us know. You can email info at canbefoursquare.com. We would love to hear what's going on in your life, and we would really want to reach out and help. And by the way, uh, Can Before Square, along with Oswego Grill, are coordinating meals that can go out into the community every day. And so we want to be part of just sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in that way. We also want to encourage you to support your local merchants. Uh, I, I know they need you right now, so whatever you can do to do that, that would be amazing. We're also working at rolling out uh, three-minute devotionals this week on Facebook and our Instagram so that you can go online every single day and just hear a devotional, hear from one of our leaders, one of our pastors. We think that's so important that you continue to follow Jesus, making disciples who make disciples for Jesus. We want to continue to do that. We also know that you uh, are looking online every Wednesday afternoon. So Wednesday, remember this, Wednesday at 11 o'clock, continue to pray. We've asked everyone on Wednesday at 11 o'clock, if you can just stop for a moment, pray for your community, pray for your neighbors. That's the the time that all of our leaders are meeting together, we're praying and we're thinking and, and, and looking into what do we continue to do to help the gospel of Jesus Christ get to our communities. And then Wednesday afternoon, I come on and do a, a blog, a video blog, so everyone knows what we're looking forward to doing in the next few days. We're also cooperating with our communities. We're working with our fire department. We're working with our city government, finding ways that we can uh, reach out and help those that are in need. So continue to pray that way. And one last thing we want to do right now is just want to introduce to you the Egley family, Ryan and Sabrina and their son Liam. They're our new youth pastors, so we've asked them to come on up here so people can see you. We're going to keep a distance. We're going to practice that, but we're going to pray and ask God just to touch you. We just want to thank both you guys and Liam. Thank you. Uh, I know it's difficult to make the changes you've made to come here and be part of our our church community. Uh, Ryan, you grew up here. You came here about four or five years old. You went through our internship, Canby Bible College. Uh, then the best thing you ever did after Jesus was you met Sabrina. And uh, then this is the result. It's Liam. So Liam, it's good to see you. It's so good to see you. We're going to do this. If you're at home right now, uh, wherever you are, we want to make sure we pray for Ryan and Sabrina. Right now, it's uh, kind of tough. We saw the, the way that you already just reached out in community uh, for, with our youth on Wednesday evening. You, uh, you did an online service. So tune in on Wednesday evening. What time are we coming on? What? Uh, this Wednesday at 7. 
this Wednesday at 7. And so you can come online and you can uh, be part of our, our online youth group. That's really what this is, I guess. That's what we're doing. So let's do this. Let's pray together and ask God just to uh, be with the Egglies. Father, we just thank you for Ryan, Sabrina, Liam. We just ask your hand would be upon them. We're just so grateful that we, uh, we have them here with us. Lord, we just embrace them now. I know there are many at home just praying and uh, asking God to cover them, give them wisdom. As we continue to reach into our youth community, Lord, we want the gospel of Jesus Christ to shine. And so, Lord, we just pray in your great name that you would keep them, that you would bless them, anoint them. We're so thankful that they're here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. What we're going to do now is we're going to continue our series in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Mark, Pastor Mark, come on up, share with us, and we'll get going here. Church. Good morning, church. It is great to be together. Uh, many of you know that I am the pastor of small groups and uh, adult discipleship. And as a church, we're always looking for new ways to start small groups in our community. And uh, right now, we have created a lot of small groups in our community. As you are meeting together, you're meeting in your houses, you are uh, inviting neighbors, not too many, uh, inviting family and friends and sitting together, we are creating small groups. If we've ever needed a theology of, a, of the priesthood of all believers, it's now. That <clears throat> church, we look forward to the day where we are together, again, worshiping in, in, our, in our congregations and our buildings. We see in, in Acts chapter 2 that the, the believers, they met regularly in the synagogue and from house to house and home to home. And right now, we are in a place where we are meeting regularly in our homes. And, and I want you to feel that, church, that we do look forward to the day where we are uh, back here we're in our rows, uh, we're in our favorite spot, in our favorite seat, but we're together. Again, we look forward to that day. But right now, though we are uh, social distancing, we are not spiritually distancing. We are not spiritually distant. We are pushing in. We are engaging together. We are priests of our family. We are priests over our neighbors. We are light to the world, and what happens in this place is now happening outside of this place. So I just want to encourage you, I want to encourage families to keep meeting together, keep reading scripture together, uh, keep loving and uh, praying together. This is, is a trying time for sure, yet also highly exciting. Very exciting to see us as the church that usually comes together to be out in our community being the church. And what we're going to do as a church, we're just going to continue to keep worshiping the Lord. I would challenge us as the church that, in, that, that fear causes us to draw away from and love compels us to draw into and to draw near. And I would, and I would say during this time that there's a lot of uncertainty. There's, there's fear. There's plenty of fear floating around. Uh, all you have to do, if you're like me, I went to Costco yesterday, and that was crazy. It gave me a lot of fear. And there is fear in the atmosphere. And, and it's easy when we're afraid to, to draw back, to want to disengage but love will always compel us to engage, to, to draw near. And in a world that, that is filled with, with a good deal of fear right now, we want to continue to draw near. And so <clears throat> I would say to do the same, and, and just like Pastor Ron just led us, we, we want to not uh, 
tuck back and hide in our fear, but we want to worship through our fear. We want to we want to continue to worship. We will say we'll worship by declaring, "Here's our here's our tithe, here's our offering, Lord. Here's here's our worship. We're gonna we're gonna go and we're gonna provide food for our neighbor." Now is the time as a church to love our neighbor. We want to continue to be that example to the world. Um, we, so how we'll do that? We'll continue to to face our fear by worshiping through our fear. We'll worship uh, by supporting our local businesses. We'll worship by continuing to write our, our, our checks of worship. Um, we'll continue to uh, lack in our own personal life for the love of our brothers and our sisters. We will continue to worship by studying and reading God's word together. As you are out there, um, we are going to continue to worship through this time and worship and choose to not be led by a spirit of fear, but the spirit of the Lord. So church, what we will continue to do is we are going to get back into the word. We're going to continue in our Nehemiah series. We started a series uh, about six, seven weeks ago uh, titled Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things. And we started this series in the book of, of Nehemiah. I want to just, as a way of, as a reminder, I know that so many of you say, oh, Pastor Mark, uh, do, you, do you really need to introduce and, and remind us every week about the background of Nehemiah? But I want us to understand, I want us to be able to, when we're done with the book of Nehemiah, when we uh, are sitting around the tables talking to our children, when we're talking to friends, we could say, look, we know in Nehemiah that God gave uh, this divine call to this man named Nehemiah who had a job as a cupbearer, that he was a man that was in high position, but he was, he was 800 miles away from Jerusalem, from the, the, the country. He was an exile in a different country. I want us to be able to look and say in chapter 2 that there was this divine favor from the Lord that this, this king, this foreign king said, I want to give you not only money and resources, building permits, but I want to send you to lead your people back out of uh, where they, they were exiled in foreign lands, but I want you to restore your temple, your priesthood, your church, and, and your nation. And then we saw in chapter 3, just a, a few weeks ago, that chapter 3 in the book of Nehemiah is filled with this list of names. And it's names that God remembers of people who were devout and, and said, God, I want to worship you and I'll bring to you what I have, my gifts. And, and none of them were professional wall builders. None of them were masons. They were women and men and perfumers and carpenters and goldsmiths. And they just said, here I am, Lord, use me. And, and, they, and we saw the list of the names. And then in chapter 4, a couple weeks ago, we saw that the, the building began, that the construction of the wall had begun. And we have a list, that list of names are people who were building this wall and opposition came. That we see the first bit of opposition, the, the, the most ink spilled to the book of Nehemiah is three and a half chapters of opposition, of them being, um, of, of them having opposition from around the uh, surrounding nations. And now in chapter four, we'll look, or in, excuse me, in chapter five, we'll look at opposition uh, from within. We're going to look at chapter four and we'll look at opposition from within. Opposition from within is the people of God are no longer not just being opposed by the people, the surrounding nations, but we're going to see how the people of God and other Jewish people are suppressing them, that they're fighting against them as they're trying to build and rebuild the temple, as they're trying to rebuild the priesthood, as they're trying to rebuild this wall, that they start to feel pressure from their own people. Today's sermon, we will look at four uh, different uh, points. The people, the problem, the solution, and the example. Today's sermon will be broken up into the people, the problem, the solution, and the example. Now, there was a, there's a, a pastor and a great theologian named uh, John Stott and 
John Stott, he wrote a book, and it was uh, titled In Between Two Worlds, and it is a wonderful book that uh, I have loved over the years, and the point of the book is teaching pastors and, and theologians and those that, and small group leaders and anyone that uh, how to hold this ancient text and at the same time to, to stand in one world, the book is called In Between Two Worlds, and you're holding an ancient text and how to apply that into a modern world. This is really the work of the preacher. This is really the work of those who would teach us scripture. And, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of times it's a lot harder than, uh, than you would think. When you get, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, when you get to a list of names, 50 names and 32 locations of a huge wall, that gets a, a bit difficult to apply to a modern context. And in chapter 5, I would have said a couple weeks ago, it would have been really difficult to communicate uh, scarcity. It would have been really difficult to communicate a famine. It would have been really difficult to communicate uh, high levels of selfishness, of people hoarding and taking things for themselves, people seeing um, a problem and, and trying to capitalize on it and make money in that situa situation. That would have been a difficult task um, just a short time ago to, to really communicate to our Western world. Um, I found this article that I would like to think about uh, together as a church. And as we dive into chapter 5, I want to see how this applies to our situation. This is an article written by the New York Times uh, author uh, Jack Nikus, and it was published March 14th, 2020. So follow along with me here. On March 1st, the day after the first coronavirus death in the United States was announced, brothers Matt and Noah Colvin set out in a silver SUV to pick up some hand sanitizer, driving around Chattahooga, Chattanooga, Tennessee. They hit the Dollar Tree, then the Walmart, a Staples, a Home Depot. At each store, they cleaned out the shelves. Over the next three days, Noah Colvin took 1,300-mile road trip across Tennessee and into Kentucky, filling up a U-Haul truck with thousands of bottles of hand sanitizers, thousands of packs, thousands of packs of antibacterial wipes, mostly from little hole-in-the-wall dollar stores and backwood mom-and-pop shops. His brother said that the major metro areas were cleaned out. Matt Colvin stayed home near Chattanooga, preparing for pallets or even more wipes and sanitizers that he had ordered and starting to list them on Amazon. Mr. Colvin said, uh, Mr. Colvin said he had posted 300 bottles of hand sanitizer and immediately sold them between $8 and $70 a bottle, each multiple times higher than he had bought them. He was quoted saying, it's crazy money, end quote. To many others, it was profiting from a pandemic. Michaela Kovlatsky, a nurse in Dudley, Massachusetts, has been searching for hand sanitizer since before she gave birth to her first child, Noah. Uh, sorry, first child, Nora. And on March 5th, she went and searched the stores, which were all sold out. She skipped getting gas to avoid handling the pumps. And when she checked Amazon, she couldn't find a bottle for less than $50. What we see in this article, as we, 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 we think about the situation that as a, as a worldwide pandemic that we're in, that we see that there are always people who will see people who are suffering, people who cannot get to resources that are limited to, and will capitalize on that. And in the, in 
Nehemiah chapter 5, we see the same thing happening with God's people. We'll see the same uh, situation where people are capitalizing on other people's weakness. And this morning, we will see that God has something to say about that. We will look first now, and if you have your Bibles nearby, turn to Nehemiah chapter 5. And in Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, we will get familiar with the people. So please read along with me. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish people, Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us, let us get grain and that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet they're forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men... Of other men own our fields and our vineyards. I'll stop right here. There are three groups of people in this opening text. There are a group of people who have said, Lord, I will follow your call to help build the land. We are in. We are going. We're going to make sacrifices. They are being uh, taken out of uh, exile. They're being taken out of, uh, they're leaving their homes. They're going and they're living day to day. They're they're day-to-day living. They don't have a mortgage. They don't have a house. But they're trying to set up in this new land to join with the restoration project of God's people. That's group one. And then in group two, there's another group of people. um, and And there's probably some blend that do have land, that do have fields. And what they're doing is they're mortgaging their lands. They're mortgaging their fields. And they're, they're, um using the money to help build this wall. They're using this money to help live. And we don't know where this famine came from. We don't know if it's uh, just local famine and the people, they don't have enough time to be rebuilding the city. They don't have enough time to be rebuilding the temple. They don't, and, and so they can't harvest their own fields. We don't know why this famine exists, but there is a, there's a famine, and the taxes, they're being taxed highly on their land. And then there's this third group of people that they're, they're, they're probably a blend of, the, of both groups as well, but they have come to the place where they're, they're getting highly taxed, they're mortgaging their fields, they're mortgaging their lands, and what they've done is they have, they, they've taken their kids and they've had to say, look, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sell my children into slavery, and I'm going to essentially pawn them. I want to, I want to give you my kids to, to help afford what's happening and help to afford this tax and this famine, and, and they're, they're selling their children into slavery. And, and we'll see kind of where this might be coming from a little bit later on in the text. But if you can imagine with me a, a people who are so desperate that, that they're not, they don't have enough to eat. They're not, they don't have um, extra resources. And the only good idea that they're coming up with is to essentially pawn their children in hopes of buying them back. But the text says that uh, they, they can't even get their children back because, because of the fact that they have no rights. They cannot control their vineyards and their fields. They're being taxed, highly taxed. And we'll, and we'll see the people behind this in just a few minutes. But I, for me, it would be difficult for us in the West, like I had mentioned, to understand what's happening here. And I thought, man, this would be really hard for us to really imagine a scarcity of goods and resources. And then, like many of you, I went to Fred Meyer this week. You walk down the aisle of Fred Meyer or Target or Safeway, and you just see rows and rows and rows of, of the no canned foods, of no toilet paper, of no sanitizer, of, of resources being taken. Uh, I went to 
Costco yesterday and saw the line, if you saw my Instagram account, where the line went from one corner, the far back corner behind the building of Costco. It came all the way out to the front of Costco, all the way back to the other corner. It went to the tire center and back in. People being let in, they're, they're hungry for these, these resources. They're, they're, they're just leveling out um, uh, bins in the middle of, of Costco and rows and rows of food. Rice is, is scarce. The, when we, by the time we got there, all the rice was almost gone. There's no hand sanitizer. There's, we, we can understand to some degree, not to the place of selling our children, obviously, but we can understand this text probably better than any other time in our recent history. Those are, the, those are the people, and we want to look now at, the, at the, the problem. In Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter uh, 5, verses 6 through 8, read along with me. I was very angry. Then I heard their outcry of their words. I'll, I'll actually stop right there for a second. Nehemiah's response here is great anger. He is angry angry at the situation that he's getting ready to hear about. And I want us to understand something, that there certainly is a place for a godly anger. That when we are in these situations and when we look around and we see the world and we see other people suffering at, at, at the expense of, of selling a $70 bottle of hand sanitizer, there's something in us that should make us angry. There's something in us that should say, as, as humanity, that's not right. That Nehemiah, he is angry here. And I, and I like what the Bible says next. And, uh, and I heard the outcry of the words, and I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles. That Nehemiah, he's angry, and then he took counsel with himself. And we see that Nehemiah, he comes and he directly looks at these nobles. He grabs them and he says, and, and he charges these nobles and he calls them out publicly. And we see Jesus, similarly in the New Testament, Jesus himself, he goes into Jerusalem and he goes into the temple and he sees that people are, are unjustly paying high taxes. They're paying uh, high prices for making an offering in the temple. Jesus himself is angry. Jesus himself directly goes to those, and, and there's an outcry that this is not right. Let's keep reading. I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother, and I held a great assembly against them. And I said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold into the nations, but you... You even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent, and they could not find the words to say. What's happening, what appears to be happening in this text, a part of the campaign for uh, Nehemiah, when he is, is leaving, um, that, he, that he is uh, leaving the country that he's been exiled in, and he's going back to rebuild his nation, that he is the governor uh, for 12 years here, and he is rebuilding the nation. What he's doing is he's buying back uh, Jewish people who have been exiled and been slaved in other countries. He's buying them back, and part of the campaign and part of the, the expense that's being had is he's buying back people that have been enslaved to other nations. Now, the Old Testament has some uh, strict rules against slavery. There's some strict rules against how slaves ought to be treated and that they ought to be released. And what we see here in the text, remember the nobles. These are who who Nehemiah is, a, is addressing, these nobles, in, in chapter, in, in, our, in our last chapter, that these were the ones that were too good to work. They put up their nose to the work of the Lord. Here, these are the ones that are, are selling people. This is what's happening. They're going around, they're saying, look, this Nehemiah character, he is going around and he's buying back the slaves. He's buying them out of slavery. Why don't we profit off of this? Why don't we sell our people into slavery 
And we'll make a little money. We'll make the money from the initial sell. And it's no big deal. Nehemiah, he'll come back, and he will buy them. It's not that big of a deal, right? It's just taking some people and putting them into slavery. It's a huge deal. Nehemiah sees this, and he is angry, that he's greatly angered. Nehemiah sees this. He addresses the people. You have put them into slavery. They were silent, and they could not say a word. This is, this is the problem. People are in a place, in a position where they, they financially, they don't have resources. They're in a position where they can't speak for themselves. They're a, a suppressed people group. And they're being sold by their own people. They're being used as a commodity. And Nehemiah, his heart is grieved. And, and, and it, even, it even shows that Nehemiah, that he was probably a part of giving, um, giving out these loans. That he was a part of exacting high interest. In verse 10, it says, Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants were lending them money and grain. Let us abandon the exacting of interest. Nehemiah was probably saying, yeah, I'll give you a loan, I'll give you some grain, and you can pay me back some interest. But Nehemiah, he is convicted. Nehemiah, the difference here, the solution to our problem is in Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 9. And I want to draw your attention here. Church, this is the main point of the whole text, and I really want us to understand what is being said in this point here. Verse 9, so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Do you not, do you not walk in the fear of God to prevent the taunts of the, our enemies? And the two things that are happening here is that Nehemiah... He is, he is expressing a fear of the Lord. That when we would, would be in front of the Lord, we see in the book of Proverbs, the book of the Proverbs, the, the wisdom literature, the, 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 the book of Proverbs says that the, uh, the beginning of all wisdom, the beginning of all wisdom is a fear of the Lord. That again, Isaiah 66, uh, it it compels us that we would deeply tremble before the Lord, that we would fear the Lord. And throughout the Bible, that when people came into the presence of the Lord, uh, I I know sometimes we want to make uh, the fear of the Lord be this kind of reverence thing. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're esteemed highly to me, God. No, in the, in, in throughout Scripture, When the presence of the Lord would show up, people would hit the floor. People would be on their knees with their head down. That they'd be, I am not worthy. That we we saw this in Isaiah. That in in Isaiah chapter 6, me of unclean lips. That that Job, that that after a long, long uh, uh, talk throughout the the entire book of Job, that, that Job just shuts his mouth. That, that Paul, uh, the man who is persecuting Christians, as he's on his way uh, on, on the Damascus Road, he is stopped and he is blinded in the presence of the Lord. That the fear of the Lord that has just struck him, that the Lord shows up and the fear of the Lord is put into him. The, the, the fear of the Lord here isn't just a behavioral change. It's, it's a whole position. It's a whole posture of our hearts before the Lord. And, and Nehemiah, he contrasts here his position of fear of the Lord. And later in verses 14 through 19, that Nehemiah goes through and he says, Look, I was the, I was the governor and I, for 12 years and I didn't take an, I didn't take an, an allowance. I didn't take the, the food allowance that I should have been given. I didn't take land so that there would be more resources for the other people. Nehemiah uses himself as an example. My servants served. They didn't lord over the others. Nehemiah is the example here. And Nehemiah serves as an example. And he says in verse 9, verses 
in verse 9b, to prevent the taunts of the nations. This is meant to be an example. We are meant to fear the Lord. Uh, Christians that are logged on with us, that are listening to this sermon, as, as faith-filled followers of Jesus, that we fear the Lord, that we, would, we, don't, we don't walk in fear. We don't, we're not fearing that, um, uh, the same fears that are all around us. Do we have fears? Yes, of course. And we, we continue to walk in trust with the Lord. But we, we fear the way that we would, we would live our lives, that we would live our lives in a way that we're not feared that uh, we didn't help people, that we would, we, would be, we, we, we would be fearful that we don't help people, that we wouldn't be fearful that we might run out of toilet paper or hand sanitizer, but that we wouldn't help those that are the most vulnerable. We want to be people who fear the Lord because someday we will be judged. Someday we'll stand before this great God and before his throne. And we'll say, God, were we an example or were we just, just like the nations? Here we don't want to be found as the, the taunt of the nations. We want to be seen as an example to the nations. We want to be an example to our neighbors. That we're to love the Lord our God with all of our mind and our soul and our strength. And to love our neighbor as ourself. Church, this is a great time. There, there may have not have been a better time in recent history to love our neighbor as ourself. Does this mean that we don't have fear? Of course not. Do we, do we know what's going to happen down the road? Do we know what the future looks like? Of course not. But we do know and we do worship the God who's in control, the God who is sovereign over all the world from the foundations of the earth, the one that had laid the stars of heaven, the one that set our universe and our solar system into motion, the one that was, has no beginning and the one that has no end. He is sovereign and in control. And I want us to know, church, that, that God was not blindsided. God didn't uh, get blindsided and go, oh, man, I never saw that coming, that, that, that worldwide pandemic. Church, be encouraged today that God is in control. Church, that God holds the keys to the future. That we trust in a God who not only is sovereign and in control, but who deeply loves his people. Church, we are in the biblical form of encouragement. It means to impart courage. It means to put courage into someone. If, if you were thinking about, um, you know, my coffee cup this morning, it was first a cof coffee mug alone, and then I took the coffee, and I put coffee into it. I imparted something into that mug. And in the same sense, church, we together are to import Cur to, to import courage into those around us. We're not, we're not meant to just look like the world around us and, and, and fear the same things that the world fears, but we're to bring comfort. We're to bring peace. Right now is the time that we, we think about ourselves less and think about our, our neighbors more. Now is the time, church, to shine, to to be the church to our, to our neighbors, to those who are most vulnerable. <clears throat> now is the time for, for multiple generations that, that there's, there's kind of this, this tension politically between the boomers and the millennials or Gen Z, and, and, and we need one another more than ever. We need the older generation. Uh, that might be going and picking up groceries for your grandparents or that elderly couple next door to you. That might be teaching some of them how to log on to the internet so that they can watch church or so that they can pay bills. However we can serve one another church. The solution, the example we see 
in Nehemiah verses 14 through 19, Nehemiah himself, he understood this commandment that we would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind and our soul, and to love our neighbors. And this is only a shadow of Christ. This is only but a shadow of how Christ would come and that he would love us. That he didn't just come to risk his life, but he came to ultimately give his life. That we see in, in, in Mark chapter 10, verses 45, that Jesus, that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to ransom his life for many. Church, in the book of Nehemiah, we see a people group who are, are being suppressed, who are weak and vulnerable. And in other times, we, it might be difficult for us to, to get our minds around this, but if we look around in this time, I pray, church, that we would be a church that is a light to a world, that we wouldn't see this time as a time where we can't go down and sit for a couple hours in Starbucks. We wouldn't see this time as a, as a time where we can't go to our favorite restaurants, but we could see this time as, as just the dawn to a revival. There has been no renewal. There has been no revivals that haven't started out of an initial crisis. This is a time to get us uh, reset from the things that were, were just comfortable. The things to the church here in the West that we're not, we don't fear persecution as much as, uh, as our greater enemy, comfort, entertainment, being easily satisfied. And, and in church, right now, I pray that this gets us out of our comfort zone. I pray that it would cause us to think about others more, think about ourselves less, and love our communities. Church, I pray that Nehemiah chapter 5 blesses you as much as I have been blessed. Let us continue to be the church. Let us continue to be a priesthood of all believers to our communities. Let us pray. Jesus, I pray for our church, our worldwide church. I pray for our church that it's at home. I pray for peace to those that are outside of these walls of this church. God, I pray for our community that they would be a people who are um, comforted by the fact that you rule and reign on your throne. That this is not out of control from your hand. God, that this is not a time to pick sides, but rather to love humanity and love our fellow man, to care and serve as you cared and served us, Jesus. That, that you did not only just serve the world, Lord, you came and you laid your life down for the world, that we would ultimately be with you forever, Jesus. God, I thank you for the community. I thank you for the, those who love you, God. I pray that you would continue to comfort them. And God, we pray for our, our doctors and our scientists. I pray for um, a, a breakthrough, a cure for this uh, pandemic. Lord, we pray for the doctors, for hospitals that are filled to the gills right now. Lord, that, um, that, the, that the needs seem to be overwhelming. God, I pray peace and comfort and, and uh, sharp minds. Lord, I pray for us as the world. I pray that this, um, as it seems like so often, we can be so divided politically. But God, I pray that as... As a world, we can come together and realize our need for one another. God, I pray that ultimately it would point to our need for you. God, that there is a bigger pandemic in the world. And it's a pandemic of, of not knowing you, Jesus. That there are lost souls who have not yet come to know you. God, let our hearts be filled. Let our hearts be full of love to show your love to our neighbors and our surrounding people. We love you in your name, Jesus. Amen.